to hear an event, right, we first, like I said, we need to know where we want to hear it. There's this movie clip, this button, the sound object. Then we just write add event listener on it. When we write add event listener, we specify which event we want to hear and what function we want to run. Right? So if we want to listen for a click, this is what it looks like. We'll listen for a click on a specific button, my BTN. We tell it to add an event listener. We're going to listen for a click event, and then we're going to run a function which we call the callback function. Uh, so we can see how that works here. Right? So uh, we'll, we'll, put a, we'll put a listener for the click event on a button called tracer. We'll run a function called trace out. Uh, and then in trace out, all we're doing is actually tracing the event object itself, right? So that's actually one of the important things to know about getting started with events is the callback function needs to expect an argument. That's what any event uh, event handler basically looks like, right? There's something that you listen to, you listen, uh, you use add event listener to listen to it, then you have a callback function that does something in response. And to reiterate, right, to repeat, that's the same code that we use to listen for any event in the entire language. Now, right, just like the first step of learning how to use a gun is learning how to use the safety, uh, it's really important as soon as you start working with listeners to know how to start cleaning up after your listeners, right? Because, well, there are two real, I mean, in general, you just, you don't want things happening in your code that you haven't planned for, right? So you don't want to hear a call, but you don't want to hear an event triggering a callback function if you're not expecting it anymore, right? If you've already handled that scenario or it shouldn't be happening. And, uh, Two, right, listeners, like everything else in our code, consumes memory. So if we don't clean this up, we're, we're not using the system resources efficiently. The way you remove a listener is with remove event listener. And you call it with the same exact arguments that you called add event listener. It does not trigger an error, right, if you remove an event listener that wasn't added. Right? Just like you can listen for an event that never is fired and that doesn't trigger an error, you can remove an event that wasn't added. So as we see here, the code to remove the onClick uh, callback function on the My button uh, is the exact, right, the exact same arguments, except we're using the remove event listener method. All events are objects. Right? So in, unlike in real life where an event maybe isn't like a real thing, right? you can't touch uh, a party, you can't touch a parade necessarily. In Flash, uh, uh, all events, everything that we would think of as an event is actually an object. It's something that consumes resources. It's a tangible thing. These event objects are created and dispatched in our movie. That's what we hear is we hear the dispatching of the event. Every event that we're ever going to listen to is either uh, an instance of the event event or an inheritor of the event event. So either we're going to listen the event that we're hearing is going to be an event, like event.change, or it'll be an inheritor of the event, like mouse event.click, mouse event inherits from event, right? So all events in the language stem from this one class, the event object. What's really important to understand about events inside of Flash is not only that they are objects, but that these objects, these event objects, they flow through our movies. Uh, specifically, they flow through the display objects on our display list. Right, so if we use this sample uh, display list, we have a stage, our stage has two movie clips on it, each movie clip has two movie clips in it, each one of those has one in it, right? This is our display list. So let's say the user now clicks on sub 1A. Okay, so if the user clicks on sub 1A, Right, we have our, our event is created and it goes through three phases. Right, the first is the capture phase. So the event is heard, it's created, it's dispatched from the stage down to MC1, down to MC1A. Right, so in the capture phase, the object travels from the stage to what's known as the target of the event. Then in the target phase, the event is heard on the target. Right. And then it'll be heard all the way back up from the target to the stage in what's known as the bubble phase, right? So um, it'll travel from sub 1A up to MC 1A, MC 1, back all the way up to the stage. So the full flow of our event in this example, right? We, the event is created, dispatched on the stage, goes down the capture phase, MC1, MC1, A, it then travels to sub 1A where the, it enters the target phase, then travels back up in the bubbles phase, right? So that event can be heard at multiple times in multiple places in multiple phases. Events in Flash are actually pretty dumb. There's very little that they could know, 
or store or do. Right? They only contain what they are programmed to contain. Which brings us to an issue because a lot of times we want our events to trigger actions that depend on variables. Clicking one of eight different buttons doesn't load the same page. Each button loads its own page. Right? So we depend on variables. It's not just knowing that an event happened. It's also knowing some variable piece of data associated with that event. We have the text event that we can play with, but the text event only gets us a single piece of data. There are two solutions here. Potential. This one is the easier one. Every time an event is created, that event object has a piece of information known as the target. What was the source of this event? So at any point in the event flow, whether we're hearing that event right on the object or it bubbled up to the stage or wherever we're hearing it, we can talk to that event and say, hey, what was your target? What spawned you? How many variables can we create in a movie clip? Was it infinite? I think it was infinite. That's more than one, right? So the gimmick here is that you store all the information you need in the movie clip. Then the stage or wherever we have hearing this can say, I don't, I know that you, Mr. Event, don't know what image I'm supposed to load. You don't know what title I'm supposed to display, but you do know who sent you. So let me talk to the person who sent you and get the image and the title and the description. And that's the target reference solution, right? So this gets us effectively unlimited data capacity because our source movie clip, I mean, in this example, we just need three pieces of data. It could be hundreds of pieces of data. And uh, it also doesn't need to be a movie clip, right? Any object in Flash we can create. Basically, we can create variables on. Again, I'm using movie clips as a simple example because you can just create a variable on the timeline and now your movie clip has that data in it. So all of the prior solutions that we examined all work within the native event model. The broadcaster that we're about to explore is one popular, I'd, I'd say probably the most popular way in the Flash world of getting out of the native event model. So what is the broadcaster? The broadcaster is what's known as a singleton. A singleton is a design pattern. And what, when you create a singleton, when you author a singleton, what that means is you can only create one instance of this object. Okay, so the way that a broadcaster is written, and it actually, it's not that much code, but it can look a little intimidating. Uh, the way that it's written, uh, it's written so that it can only be created once. So it's not a static class, it's an instantiated class, but there's only ever one of them in your app. And that's important, right? Because if you're loading in other Swifts that utilize the broadcaster, you want to make sure that they're all using the same single broadcaster. And you'll see why that is important. Because it functions as a centralized hub for all communication, all event communication, right? So within the native event flow, all of our events are mediated by display objects based on their position within the display list. And as I said earlier, right, it's even if we're not using bubbling, then we're using direct references, which com depend completely on the relative position in the display list. So that is the core limitation of events in Flash, is they just depend completely on the friggin' display list. With a broadcaster, all events are mediated directly by the single broadcaster. Okay, that's why it's really important there's only one of them. That's why the fact that it's a singleton isn't just kind of a throwaway line. Right? There's only one of them. So what I'm talking about is here on the left, you'll recall that's what a normal event flow looks like. Like if the user clicked on sub 1A, that's what it looks like. On the right, we can see the event flow with a broadcaster. Right? It's 1 to N. Every object that wants to dispatch an event dispatches it on the broadcaster. Every object that wants to hear an event, hears it on the broadcaster. All events go through the broadcaster, right? The display list, the event dispatcher, those are all completely irrelevant at this point. 